Amen. We thank God for another beautiful day. And uh, you guys got to pray for me. I had a rough night. Uh, we had, uh, from 7 or 8 o'clock last night, we had three people killed. And uh, it's been a rough night in Camden. So y'all keep Elder Stevens in your prayers. Amen. Let's pray. Father, in the name of Jesus, we give you praise and we thank you for your goodness and mercy. We thank you for the opportunity to hear your word. I thank you for the opportunity to preach your word. I pray, God, that your word would transform our lives. I pray, God, that you would just encourage our hearts. I ask that you look upon everybody here today that needs a blessing, whether it be physical, material, financial, whatever it is, dear God, spiritual, we ask that you would bless your people, not only here in Mount Calvary, but everywhere. And just continue to watch over and protect uh, my wife while she's away and everybody else that's uh, at the convention. And we just pray for a safe travel for all of them in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Praise God. I want to talk a little bit today about a topic that uh, a lot of times as Christians, we don't know how to deal with. And it's, it's kind of a weird topic, uh, but it's something we need to, to discuss. And I want to talk about anger today. Anger. Uh, you know, this past week, a lot of folks had a lot to be angry about. You know, if you were watching the elections, I'm sure that some of y'all in here were angry at the uh, outcome of the election. I was shocked. <laughs> I, think a, I, think a lot of, I think a lot of people were shocked, too. <laughs> you know, a lot, of, a lot of people were shocked, but I think a lot of people were angry, too. And, you know, it's funny because I have a weird sense of humor, and sometimes I'm, I'm sitting there watching the news, and, uh, and I was thinking about that... Uh, that song by the, the, the rapper DMX, y'all gonna make me lose my mind up in here, up in here. <laughs> y'all gonna make me act a fool. And I was just thinking to myself, I said, this is crazy. But there's a lot to be angry about. I mean, I've been dealing with anger issues for the last few months, especially when I watch the news and I see countless numbers of people getting shot and killed, unarmed people getting killed uh, by the police. and the violence here in Camden and some of the other things that I just exposed to it being a chaplain, it just makes me angry. And sometimes I think we have a tendency to look at anger as always being something negative. But the truth be told, anger can be a positive. Um, if you look back at the Civil Rights Movement, it took an angry young man named Martin Luther King to stand up and say, look, we can't take this no more. Now, he didn't react with violence, but he reacted in a way that got the national attention that was needed to end the Jim Crow laws of the South. And sometimes anger can be a motivator that we need to get the job done. See, the opposite of anger sometimes is indifference. And for those of you who don't know what indifference is, indifference is when you just don't care. And a lot of times, a shot of anger will stir, stir you up to make indifference leave. You know, it's a crying shame when people can walk to church and walk right past a homeless person and not give them something to eat. That's indifference. But anger will make a person say, wait, let me give this guy a Big Mac. You know, that anger will say, I, I, I see this person over here hungry. I see this person. And so sometimes anger can be good. Uh, so turn me to John chapter 2. John chapter 2, starting in verse 12. And of course, this story we're about to read is one of those stories in the Bible where a lot of folks don't like to talk about. John chapter 2, verse starting in verse 12. After this, he went down to Capernaum, he and his mother and his brethren and his disciples, and they continued there not many days. And in, and and the Jews' Passover was at hand. And Jesus went up to Jerusalem and found in the temple those that sold oxen and sheep and doves and the changes of money sitting. And when he had made a scourge of small cords, he drove them all out of the temple and the sheep and the oxen and poured out the changers' money and overthrew the tables. And said unto them that sold doves, Take these things hence, make not my father's house a house of merchandise. And this is one of those hard stories for people to see in the Bible because 
This is one of the rare occasions when Jesus got gangster. Y'all know what it means to get gangster, right? When you just kind of flip out and you just, uh, you know, come y'all, y'all grow up in Camden, you know what it means to get gangster. Come on now. Jesus got gangster. He's like, okay, I'm not taking this no more. And sometimes in life, things happen to make you say, I'm not taking this no more. And sometimes that anger has to be motivation to get you to do what's right. And sometimes people have a, have a hard time understanding it. And people had a hard time understanding this because they never saw Jesus lose it. But let me explain to you why Jesus lost it. What was going on was, back in those days, there were a lot of people that were called proselytes. And what a proselyte is, was a person that was Jewish, not by birth, but by faith. And so whenever they had the feast and the different ceremonies in the temple, the Sabbath, the Shabbat, not only were there Jews that lived right there in Jerusalem, but there were proselytes that came from long distances to worship in the temple. Now, some of them weren't all proselytes. Some of them were Jews that maybe lived far away. Now, the way it was back in the Old Testament was, unlike today, when you come to church, you just come to church. You don't have to bring a goat. You don't have to bring a dove. You don't have to bring an ox. You just come to church and worship God because we're the temple of God. You don't have to bring anything, just bring yourself. But back then when you went to church, you brought, if you were poor, you brought a turtle dove. And that was a, that was a sacrifice for somebody that was poor. Or, you know, if you had sheep or oxen, you'd bring a goat or you'd bring something for the sacrifice. Well, what was happening was the people that came a long way, a lot of times they didn't have an opportunity to get anything or bring anything. And they were still welcome in the temple because Jesus said something that was very key we need to understand. He said, this is the house of prayer. What Jesus was more concerned about was people coming into the presence of God and praying. So, and, and this is the other thing too, they, these, these money lenders were taking advantage of people because basically what they were doing, how many of y'all ever been to see a Phillies game? Or a Yankee game, I say Yankee hat over there. Been a Yankee game, okay. I've been a, and you go to the stadium and you're hungry. Right? So you know that if you were to buy a pack of hot dogs at Acme, you can get a pack of hot dogs, especially them cheap chicken, chicken hot dogs, for about two or three dollars. You go to a dollar store and get hot dogs. But when you go to a Phillies game, you're gonna pay as much for one hot dog as you would pay for a pack of hot dogs. And then get away with it because where else are you gonna get a hot dog? Well, that's the way it was with the money lenders. They knew that. If you wanted to get a sacrifice and you weren't able to bring one from where you were at, you had to bring the money, pay them, and then also with that people that were selling it, they had money changers, meaning like when you go to another country, you know, like here in America, you use dollars. In Mexico, you use pesos. And you should be able to get what they call a fair rate of exchange. What the money changers did was this. They said, instead of giving you a fair rate of exchange, they were ripping people off. So they could buy their sacrifice. You know, he might come up there with 20 pesos and it might be worth, say, $18. But what the money changers would do is say, instead of giving you $18, they give you $10. But they had you trapped because there was nowhere else for you to go. And so Jesus was like basically saying, okay, you guys have polluted my house. People are trying to come here to get their sins forgiven. People are trying to come here to get um, prayers through and you're holding them hostage. And Jesus flipped out. He flipped out. Now, a lot of times, it's hard for us to conceive Jesus losing his temper. But the Bible's explicit, and the Bible says, be angry and sin not. You can be angry and not sin. His anger didn't cause him to sin. His anger caused him to take action. And that's one of the things that's lacking in the modern church today is a lot of action. I had somebody say this to me the other day. I was trying to be as, as low-key as possible when it came to the election. Because I had my, my personal opinions about Donald Trump, and I didn't want to get into it at work. I'm, just, I'm at work. I'm trying to be professional. And one of the uh, guys, one of my fellow chaplains at the uh, uh, hospital, he decided he was going to come in and just start bragging about Donald Trump winning. And I'm in my office trying to talk to somebody about business, and he's going to come in and, and, and make a little smart comment. So 
I said, uh, come on in, close the door. I said, first of all, I said, you're Jewish, right? He said, yes. And I said, how would you like it if a president was running and somebody from the Nazi party was supporting him? You wouldn't like that, would you? And he said, no. I said, well, the KKK supports Donald Trump. And this is what he said to me. He said, oh, that's different. Well, guess what? All my calm and peace went out the window. I got angry. And I started giving him a history lesson about the KKK. And I started telling him about the thousands and thousands of black people that got lynched by the KKK. The thousands and thousands of black people that got arrested by the KKK because the KKK used to be in the police departments down south. Almost every cop in the, in the south was in the KKK. So right after slavery, hundreds of thousands of black men went to jail, and that's how they, you know, we, we talk about the chain gangs, that's where that whole concept came from. Because the farms that used to be run by the black folks that were slaves, now you're prisoners and you're still working the farms. So I said this to him, and he goes, well, that's not quite the same. I said, why isn't it the same? Why isn't it the same? He just couldn't understand it. So I said, well, let me just say this. Let's not talk about this no more today. He's going to come back again. So I had to really, I, 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 I just lost it. And later on, I apologized, but you know what? That, that, that taught me a lesson about two things. Things that you're passionate about and things that get you like that, the best way to deal with it is to take action. Now, having riots and tearing up stuff, that's not good action. That's bad action. Good action would be to do things proactive within your community to make it better. You know, like for example, we see some of the things that are going on in our community. Some, a lot of them aren't good. But the church right now, Mount Calvary, we're trying to do some proactive stuff. We're feeding the hungry. You know, we're talking to people about the Lord. We're inviting people to church. Let your anger motivate you to do good. You know, when I see somebody, i never forget one time, I was right here at Mount Calvary, it was years ago. There was a man right across the street by the Chinese restaurant slapping a little kid. And when I say slap, it wasn't like no little tap. He was like just slapping this kid, right? And I got so mad, I ran over before I realized. I grabbed the guy by the shoulder and I pulled him. And I'm like, I'm like okay, this, I, I should have thought this through, you know? But I, I wanted to stop, I was so mad. And I looked at the guy and I said, slap me like that. And he said, you just pulled free like that. And the little kid ran off. And, and, I, and I, before I realized, I said, that wasn't a very smart thing to do. But I was angry. I couldn't stand seeing that little kid abused like that. Anger sometimes is the only thing that motivates people to do the right thing. And so sometimes, church, when you see people that are suffering or hurting or abused, channel that anger into a positive way to do something right. Like, I'll give you an example. What's going on in our country? They said already the hate crimes are starting to go up already. If you read the newspaper, folks are burning churches. They're writing nasty words on buildings and, this, and, and stuff. I think over the University of Penn, the black students have been, you know, they're putting the N-word and stuff on people's lockers and, you know. So this is the kind of stuff we're going to start seeing. Let's not, be, let's not be blind, saints. We live in an evil world. How many of y'all grew up in the 40s and 50s? I grew up in the 50s. Some of y'all did too. Y'all know what it was like down south. Well, all of a sudden now, people think that they can act like that again. Now, what can we do proactively to help deal with this stuff? One thing is pray. And we don't do enough of that. We don't do enough of that. When we call a church prayer meeting, everybody in the church needs to be at it. When we have a prayer line on the telephone, everybody needs to be on it. Because the only thing that's going to, the Bible says we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, powers, spiritual wickedness in high places. Racism is wicked. But the only way we can deal with it, first of all, is through prayer. Them demons that, 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 that did all that evil from 400 years ago up until now, the only way we can deal with it is through prayer. But then there's other things we can do. Number two, spread the good news of Jesus Christ. The only thing that's going to change people's hearts is Jesus Christ. And so we have what's necessary to help change evil hearts. Share G Jesus Christ with people. Share Jesus. Don't be afraid to tell somebody Jesus loves you. 
Don't be afraid to tell somebody he died for your sins. Don't be afraid to tell somebody that eternal life is for you. Because once a person accepts Christ and they become born again, whatever evil is running their life, all of a sudden now they're controlled by the power of the Holy Spirit. And so we have to be proactive. We have to be not just sitting on the sidelines. And sometimes, you know, our anger has to motivate us also to stand up to bullies. Stand up to people that are evil. I remember when I was about, I guess I was about 10, 11 years old. I went to school and somebody, some kid smacked me around and took my lunch money. And I went home, right? Crying, all upset, you know, and, 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 and said to my mom, he took my money. My mom just looked at me like this. Now I was expecting to get a hug. She said, come back here tomorrow like that. She said, I'm going to beat you up. And I'm like, my eyes got like that, ma, you know, you know. And then my brother got a hold of me and took me outside and said, I'm going to help you. So my brother took me outside and he said, I'm going to teach you how to defend yourself. And we got outside. It was a little, my brother was rough on me. You know, he had me on the ground and, you know, you know at first I thought he was being cruel to me. Make a long story short, the next time that same boy tried to come to me and take my money, he didn't take my money. I had him running. Now, the thing I'm saying is, I'm not saying that the church got to go beat people up because I'm not saying that. But we have to stand up to unrighteousness. We have to stand up to, to what is evil. We have to stand up for what's right and stand up for what's good. I'm going to tell you something. If it wasn't for the courage of men like Martin Luther King and Medgar Evers and Rosa Parks, we'd probably still be riding in the back of the bus. We'd probably still be drinking out of our water fountains that, that didn't have our refrigerators in them. So we, we have to understand that somebody had to stand up to the evil. And the way you stand up to evil is with good. You know, you, as Christians, we don't punch people in the face. We don't, you know, do that kind of stuff unless your life depends on it. Or somebody trying to take your lunch money. But, uh, <laughs> but the way we stand up to evil is with good. Pray for people. You know, fast. You know, uh, encourage people to do right. Preach the good news. Share the Bible with people. Give out tracts. These are the things that we can do as Christians to help make a change in the world. But you can't let somebody push you and bully you. And that's what the end of the day. The devil is the biggest bully in the world. The devil is always going to try and punk you. The devil is always going to try and make you back down on your faith. It's like when you go to work and somebody asks you a question about your faith. And you're thinking to yourself, well, if I answer this question, you know, it's, it's, it's going to make it seem like I'm a, I'm a Christian. You are a Christian. And people know you're a Christian, so, so why hide it? You know, people of other religions don't hide the fact that they're Buddhist or Muslim or whatever. So why do we always have to take back, don't be ashamed, didn't the Bible say, don't be ashamed of the good news? Paul said, warn to me if I preach not the gospel. He said, I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ, for it's the power of God and the salvation. Don't be afraid to let people know you're a Christian. Now, you don't have to be rude about it, but don't be afraid. You know, when somebody asks you to do something that's contrary to your beliefs, say, I'm sorry, I don't do that. I'm a Christian. You know, that was one of the hardest things for me when I was in the military. When I, when I accepted Christ, and I, and, I, and, and I accepted Christ when I was a teenager, but when I got in the military, I was having problems because folks were asking me to do stuff, and I knew it wasn't right. But I want to fit in. You know how we do. We don't, we don't want to get bullied. We don't want to seem like we're weird. And I'll never forget when I started basically just telling folks, I don't drink. Because I, I did used to drink. But I, when I got to the place where I wanted to be committed to the Lord, I don't drink. You don't drink? No. And you know, people still try to get you to drink. Oh, come on, one beer ain't going to hurt you. Well, that's how the enemy works. The enemy's always going to try to take, you know, just a, a, a little bit ain't going to hurt you. But you know what? The Bible says a little leaven, leaven is the whole lump. You know, don't, don't fall for the enemy's tricks. You know, the enemy's always going to try you to just slide a little bit. And when you slide a little bit, guess what? Before you know it, you, you're so far back, you, you don't realize that you got there. And no, it's not hard to backslide. It isn't. It ain't hard to backslide. You know, before you know it, you'll be in places you never thought you would be. Doing things you thought you would never do. Because the enemy's constantly trying to get us to compromise on our faith. The enemy's always trying to get you to take a back seat. I'm going to tell you something. I had a situation about maybe four years ago 
where I was doing a service at the, at the hospital. And my boss at the time, uh, not a very nice person, but he, he was always trying to test me. And uh, the service I used to do was on Wednesdays. It was like a little short devotional service. And we would have sometimes, you know, five, 10, up to 15 people coming just for the short 15 minute devotional service. And one day I saw him sitting in the back. He very rarely came, but he was sitting in the back with his arms folded, looking all evil. And so after the service, he came and said, I need to talk to you. I said, wow, what's up? He said, I need to talk to you about your service. And before he could even get it out of his mouth, the Holy Spirit let me know what he was going to say. I said, you want me to stop talking about Jesus in the service? And he looked at me and said, how'd you know? I said, I just know. And I said, to answer your question, I will not stop talking about Jesus. I said, now if you want something to replace me and get somebody else to do the service, that's fine. But I will not stop talking about Jesus. From that point on, I was his number one enemy. He couldn't rest until he could get me fired. And he passed that on to the person that replaced him, because I really should have replaced him, but I didn't. And she tried to get me fired. But you know when the Bible says no weapon formed against you will prosper? It's the truth. The weapon will be formed, but it won't prosper. It got to the place where they tried so hard to, frame, to, 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 to get me fired. They lied on me. They tried to set me up. I got to the place where I even noticed they were following me in the hospital. I would be somewhere, and I was, as soon as I got there, they were standing there. So I said, and the Lord just let me know, Look, don't worry, I got you. They even sent me home one day until they could do an investigation. And I, I, I went home. I was upset. I was angry. About two days later, I got a phone call from one of the highest directors at the hospital apologizing for what I went through. Apologizing. They said, we did an investigation. We found out that you, what was said about you wasn't true. And I thank God because that showed me two things. It showed me one thing, that Jesus is our interceder, intercessor. He's our advocate. When you can't afford a lawyer, you got Jesus. And the other thing is, no weapon formed against you will prosper. Jesus told his disciples that the very gates of hell would not prevail against the church. So don't worry. Don't be afraid to stand up for what's right. God got your back. He got your back. Sometimes the church needs to get a little gangster. Y'all know what I'm saying? Sometimes we got to get a little aggressive. And, and you know, when you get aggressive, see, a lot of times we're so, people are so used to believers being totally passive. The Bible never told us to be passive. It said, be angry, sin not. The Bible also said that the, the kingdom of God suffered violence, but the violent take it by force. Now, let me just say this. You take it by force, but there's a way you take it by force. The Bible says be wise as a serpent, harmless as a dove. I get to the place now when I'm angry, people don't know I'm angry. But the results are me being proactive and doing the will of God. You don't have to walk around frowned up and mean and nasty looking. No, you can smile all you want. But I'm not backing down from you. I'm going to smile at you, but you know what? I'm not backing down from my stance on Jesus Christ. You can say whatever you want to say to me, but the Lord is going to be my Lord, and I don't care what you say, I'm serving Jesus. And you can do it with a smile on your face. Somehow there's this misconception that believers are supposed to be weak. I guess they never saw David and Goliath. You know, God expects us to stand up against what's wrong. I, I, I know that one of the last <laughs> situations I was in, I was a correction officer for five years. And in five years as a correction officer, I never ever had to fight with an inmate. Because I was always, I used wisdom, I talked to them. Even when they were angry, I would stand looking them straight in the eye and tell them what the deal was. So I always got along with people. My last week as a correction officer, I got in a fight. And what happened was, this guy was beating up his public defender. I mean, he was trying to kill him. And I happened to be the correction officer that was walking by when this happened. So, make a long story short, I got the guy off the public defender. He decided he was going to swing on me. And, you know, well, I'll tell you, you can just imagine the rest. Because I'm a preacher, but I used to be a black belt in karate. So, I, I took care of him pretty quick. When it was all over, one of the other officers saw me doing this, and he said, Ain't you a preacher? And I said, yeah, but I'm a man too. I'm not going to let him kill somebody. I ain't going to let him hurt me. And that's what we have to understand, saints. God does not want you to be a victim. 
He wants you to be a victor. Don't be afraid. 365 times the Bible says fear not. That's one fear not for every day of the week, every day of the year. Don't be afraid. Stand up for righteousness. God's got your back. God's got your back. You don't have to worry about, you know, well, if I, if I, if I do what's right, I might lose my job. Guess what? You can lose your job. God bless you with a better one. Yeah. Stop worrying about stuff. God got your back. He's got your back. But you got to stand up for what's right. You know one of the things we have to do, church? And I'm serious about this. We got to pray for Donald Trump. I didn't vote for him, but I prayed for him every day. I pray that that man gets so saved he'd fall on the floor blowing bubbles and speaking in tongues. I want him so saved that when he, when he hears the name Jesus, he just starts going like this. Yeah, I want him to get saved. Because that's the only thing that's going to take out whatever is inside of him that's allowing a lot of this evil stuff that's going on. Yeah, you know, people, <clears throat> so let, let's remember, we have power that we don't tap into because we stay passive. Aggressively pray. Aggressively intercede. Aggressively share the good news. Don't be afraid. Don't be afraid. I'm going to tell you something about persecution. Christians in America have it made. Because the worst thing that they do to you is call you a Jesus freak or a holy roller. You go to another country and try and live for the Lord, they kill you. They lock you up. When I was in Turkey, I mean, I, I witnessed to a guy, to two, two guys or brothers and they got saved. But the third brother was a backslidden Christian. And, and, and I asked him, well, what happened? And he said, when I got saved, my family disowned me. His family, basically, they, they said, you know, and, and they, they threatened to lock him up. So basically, he could not talk about Jesus. And he said it hurt his heart because he knew he was a Christian, but he had no support. But the beautiful thing was, God sent a, 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 a staff sergeant, a tech sergeant, to Turkey for that one occasion where I could lead his two brothers to Christ. So now he has some help. It's three of them. God will send you the help you need. God, and I wasn't even supposed to be in Turkey during the war. I was supposed to be in Maine. And all of a sudden, your assignment got changed. You're going to Turkey. I was like, what? I was mad. Turkey? And I had to go there for six months. That was the reason why I went. Sometimes we go through things. We don't know why we go through them. It's because God is trying to work things out for our good. Don't get mad all the time when God's trying to move you into a different realm. Just say, let your will be done, Lord. I want to do your will. And watch him do it. Be angry, sin not. Let's pray. Father, in the name of Jesus, thank you for this opportunity to...